now in word, so that we may come to you forever. Amen. Dearly beloved, bought and won through the coming of the king. Who is coming again? Just hold on. You'd say it with some urgency to someone hanging on for dear life on the edge of a cliff. Just hold on. You'd say it maybe with a little bit of annoyance to a child who keeps asking you for something over and over again. Just hold on. You'd say it to a friend who is going through a hard time. And what you're really asking for when you say this is patience. And what you're really doing is making a promise. You're making the promise, just hold on because everything will be all right. Just hold on and we'll get it for you in a little bit. Just hold on. Help is on the way. Patience requires a promise. It requires that light at the end of the tunnel. It requires hope. In our five verse text this morning, James uses the word patience four times. And this word is the idea of long suffering, of putting up with some difficulty because of the goal at the end. Patience waits for that goal, while impatience ruins the goal. A third grade class was working on a special project. They were growing sunflowers. They planted, they watered, they waited. And pretty soon the flowers began to blossom, began to create a few seeds. And one third grade boy, pretty impatient, he didn't want to wait. He wanted to to harvest it and take the seeds and eat them. His teacher tried, tried to get him to be patient, but he didn't listen. In his hastiness, he cut down the flower and harvested the few meager, unripened seeds. Later, when all the other children who had waited harvested their far greater number of seeds, this boy was bitterly disappointed. If only he had been patient. James uses a very similar image in our text about a farmer the farmer displays patience. He waits for the early and the later rains. You know, in Palestine, they have a very different agricultural season. See, their main growing season is from October to April or May. It's like 50 and 60 degrees all the time in the winter, and it almost never freezes. So they plant in October, and there's a, there are two defined, well-defined, well-predictable rainy seasons, one in the fall and one in the spring, the early and the later. And those early rains in October, they really help the seeds to germinate and get a good start. And the later ones in the spring, they really help bring them to maturity so they get a good crop. Both of them are vital. The patient farmer waits. He doesn't freak out when it doesn't rain for a long time in, in the middle of those months. He doesn't harvest the crops and think, oh, no, if I don't harvest them soon, I won't have anything at all. He knows from experience to wait the early and the later rains, in order to bring forth that precious crop. But it's not just experience which the farmer relies on, it's also a promise. See, God had made promises to the people of Israel about their growing season, Deuteronomy 11. He will give the rain for your land in its season, the early and the later rain, that you may gather in your grain and your wine and your oil. That's what James is referring to, this promise from God that the farmers depended on. And so the farmer waits with patience until he receives the precious fruit of the earth. And so you also, James says, you also be patient until the coming of the Lord. For we too have a promise. A promise that Jesus, who came as he promised, will come again. And his coming is both far more wonderful and far surer than the rains. Hosea 6.3 Let us know let us press on to know the Lord. His going out is as sure as the dawn. He will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. You know, and it's a really good thing that this promise of Christ's coming is so sure, so confidence-giving, because as Jesus said, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. And as he promised to the disciples as he was getting ready to leave them, by your steadfastness, you will gain your lives. James uses this word steadfastness twice in our text, too. And it's really closely related to patience. It's kind of like patience to the extreme. It's continuing to, to stick to your guns, to hold on in the midst of the worst difficulties. Steadfastness is the rock in the raging river that stubbornly refuses to be moved and sends up sprays of defiant water. Steadfastness is the runner who holds on and pushes through the pain towards the finish line, refuses to give up. Steadfastness and patience, James says, are what we are in great need of to wait with patience and steadfastness for the coming of our king. We need this 
in the midst of sinners, and in the midst of suffering. There were uh, nine kids, nine kids all in a van going on vacation. Every year we, we would go on vacation in our family, usually just camping, but a couple of times we went on longer trips. One year out to Cape Cod, one year out to California, and one year down to Florida. And we drove the whole way. And you can probably imagine what that must have been like for my parents. Are we there yet? I have to go to the bathroom. She's touching me. No, I'm not. I'm almost touching you, but I'm not touching you. Uh, is it time to eat yet? And so often, I'm sure the response from the front of the car must have been, just hold on. We're, we're almost there. Or we'll stop soon. Or just hold on. Stop touching your sister. Stop hitting your sister. It's really easy for sinners who are cooped up in a van together to start grumbling and sighing and complaining about one another. And so also, it's really easy for sinners who are cooped up together in this world, waiting for that goal, for the coming of Christ, to begin to grumble and complain against one another. And especially with people that we know and love most. Apparently, this was a problem for the people that James was writing to. He says, brothers, do not grumble against one another. You know what it's like? We sinners are universally good at noticing the sins of other sinners and then grumbling about them. There's the, uh, at a husband or a wife who does something that you don't like. There's the, uh, which lets everybody know that you have the weight of the world on your shoulders and you'll just do this again and, and you're higher and mightier than everybody else and putting up with all of their troubles. There are the veiled and not so veiled accusations like, couldn't you just clean up after yourself once in a while? We're really good at this sort of thing. And, and what James is pointing out is that such grumbling is very judgmental. It comes from a lack of forgiveness. And you remember all the times that this has happened before. And it puts yourself up above the other person and passes judgment on them. This is your fault. I'm better than you. I wouldn't do that. That's why I'm grumbling. And so James warns us here with the law. He says, do not grumble against one another, brothers, because Christ is coming. And he refers to him here as the judge. The judge is at the door. And the way he talks about this reminds me of the cat in the hat. At the end of that book, the cat in the hat, the mom's coming home. And the fish in his bowl looks around at the mess, and he says, do you hear? Your mother, your mother is near. You know, what, what's she going to do? What's she going to say? James is saying, the judge is at the door. What's he going to do? What's he going to say about your grumbling, about your selfish sign? What's his response going to be? Be patient with one another, James says. And he gives another reason, too. See, it's not just judgment that Christ comes in. He also reminds us to be patient because of the goal. See, such grumbling among, one another, among each other happens when we forget about the goal, when we forget about what Christ is coming to do. There's a rather blasphemous movie where one of the main characters does something wrong and then he looks up at heaven and he says, smite me, O mighty smiter. And of course nothing happens. And that's the point. And I think a lot of unbelievers think this way about God. You know, if God was real, you know, he wouldn't let all these bad things happen. He wouldn't let me. If, it's so, if this thing I'm doing is so wrong, like you Christians say, God wouldn't just let me get away with it. But he does, because God is patient. He is long-suffering. He is like the farmer in that illustration, because he has a goal in mind. And that goal is that people should believe in him. That goal is that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He sent his son into this world to patiently bear all the grumbling and complaining of everybody against him all the time while he was in this world. He, on the body, as the wood on, on the cross, as the wood groaned under the weight of his body, groaned under the weight of the sin of the world. And his groan was this, my God, my God, why? And the answer, patience. God's patience plan to deal with sin. His desire to forgive all your sins, to pay for your grumbling by Christ's groaning, to take away your selfish sighing by Jesus' righteous dying. And from the cross, God sends forth this message into all the earth. From the cross, the seeds are sown. 
so that hearts might believe. James, earlier in his epistle in chapter 1, says, Receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. He speaks about the word as this seed which grows up in us, and its goal, the harvest, is eternal life. This is God's end game. This is his desire. And so we have good reason to be patient in the midst of sinners, in the midst of one another when we annoy each other. We have good reason to look forward with hope to that day, to be confident that our own guilt is taken away because we live in the midst of ourselves too and we are sinners. With good reason to be patient with one another, forgiving one another and loving one another, not grumbling or sighing against one another. For, do you hear? The judge is at the door. The judge who comes with mercy, the judge who comes with might to terminate the evil, to diadem the right. In our gospel reading, we found John the Baptist behind bars. It didn't take very long. You know, last week he's out preaching by the Jordan. He sees Jesus. He baptizes him, and not much longer after that, he's in jail. And this must have been really difficult for him. He, he hears about the things that are going on outside. And he sends his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the Christ or do we wait for somebody else? Now, John certainly knew that Jesus was the Christ. He proclaimed him the Christ. He pointed at him and said, behold the Lamb of God. But John was also a sinner who was in the midst of difficulty, who was in the midst of, of trial and sorrow and suffering, who was in jail. And everything that he could see from his prison must have tempted him to think, Jesus can't really be the Messiah. And so he sent his disciples to ask Jesus. You know, it must have seemed to John like he was missing out on all the action. Most nights I sit with Anastasia, I sit outside her door for about 30 minutes while she goes to sleep. And when family or friends are in town, or if there's something on that I want to be watching and I can't do it on my computer, I feel like I'm missing out on the fun. I feel like I'm missing out on the action while I'm up there. You probably had a time where you felt that way about something. Here's John. The one that he proclaimed is out there doing these miraculous things. He's healing the blind. He's, he's healing the lame. He's raising the dead. John doesn't get to see any of it. Clearly, Jesus has the power to set John free, to let him out of prison. But he doesn't. That must have been a great trial for John. But John was steadfast in the midst of this suffering because faith knows that the storm will pass that there's something beyond it. Faith does not operate on the basis of what it sees from its prison, but on the basis of what it hears. And so Jesus sent word back to John. What have I been doing? The blind receive their sight. The dead are raised. Notice he goes in advancing order in our Old Testament reading there. Uh, sorry, in our Gospel reading. He's referring to the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 35. But he goes in advancing order. Blind, healed, lame, walk, dead, raised. And the highest one is the poor have the good news preached to them. And then he adds this, just for John. Blessed is the one who is not offended because of me. John holds on to this word of God in the midst of his suffering. This is steadfastness. And we are greatly in need of the same. You know, I read a book recently, and there was a character. He was a Methodist pastor at the beginning. He left the church and renounced Christ after his wife and child died in a terrible accident. And it's all kinds of stories like that in the world. People both within and outside of the visible church point to such tragedies as evidence of the non-existence of God. You've heard people say that, right? How could a loving God allow this or that to happen? And what they're really doing is espousing the theology of glory. Theology of glory is, is this idea that I want all the stuff that Isaiah prophesied in chapter 35, I want all that stuff to be now. It's like the little boy who couldn't wait for the, for the harvest. It's like a little child stamping his feet and saying, I want it now. I want the end of sin now. I want the end of cancer now. I want no more dying or pain or sorrow or crying now. I don't want to wait for it. I want riches now. That's the theology of glory. And the theology of glory, which, which is very common in Christianity today, just go talk to Joel Osteen. Theology of glory ignores what the Bible says on every page. It ignores the examples of the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord and suffered because they spoke in the name of the Lord. Like Jeremiah, who was thrown into a pit. He 
because he preached God's word. Like Job, who suffered and needed steadfastness. Like John the Baptist, who sat there in prison because he preached the word of God. And Jesus did not set him free. Instead, he allowed wicked Herod to cut off his head. But John was steadfast to the end. Because faith does not grab onto a theology of glory. It does not grab onto a theology of now. Faith is patient. Faith is steadfast because it relies on the promise of God. This is what James also is encouraging us to do. To wait patiently. To believe that there is something beyond the storm. So he says, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. And he's speaking, of course, about that bright coming of Christ when he shatters the clouds of this earth and brings the bright eternal sunshine of his reign. And the steadfastness, the establish your hearts, he's borrowing language from our Old Testament reading. When he said, make firm the feeble knees and say to those who are weak of heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. And this is why James says we consider blessed those who suffered in the name of the Lord. You know, that's kind of a weird phrase when you think about it. We consider blessed. Blessed there, the word is sort of similar to our phrase, you lucky ducky. Except it doesn't have any of the idea of chance. It, it, it means like a charmed life. And he's talking about people who were thrown into prison, like John the Baptist, people who were martyred. He's talking about people like Job. It'd be like if you pointed at a ship that was heading into a hurricane and you said, Boy, I wish I was on that ship. But that's what faith does. Because faith knows what waits on the other side of the storm. And faith knows the God who is with us there in that boat. And the reason that James gives is this. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job and you have seen the end, the purpose, the goal of the Lord. He's saying, you know how the story ends. For those who wait patiently for Christ. You've seen it. You've seen a glimpse of it in the story of Job. What happened to Job? He has all of his possessions taken away. He has all ten of his children killed. He's struck with terrible sores. And his wife tells him to curse God and leaves him. Then his friends come and say all kinds of terrible things. Accusing him that it's all his fault. He suffers greatly. But he's steadfast. He's not perfect. He's a sinner. But he's steadfast. And he holds on to God's promise. He says, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that the last, I shall see him with my own eyes. And then at the end of the story, God blesses him with double all that he had before. And though one day Job would die and leave all that behind, those riches, those early riches, were a tiny glimpse of what lay waiting for him on heaven's shore. And this is the hope of every Christian heart. It's why we wait with patience for Christ to come again. It's why we steadfastly hold on to his promise through every storm and sorrow of life, because as it is written, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. It's because though what we see in our lives and what many of those around us in the world say might, make us, might tempt us, as John was tempted, to think that Jesus isn't really the Savior, he's not really fulfilling the prophecies of Isaiah, we live with the eyes granted by faith, seeing the promises of the word of God. And we have seen, as James says, end of the Lord, that he is merciful and gracious. We have seen this because we have seen Jesus. We have seen his mercy on the cross. We have seen him languishing there, and we have known the reason, the answer to his cry, my God, my God, why? The answer is you. You were the reason. You were the purpose of the Lord. In you, he has shown his mercy and grace. That we, passing through the storm of death, might find beyond it the sunshine of eternal life, which belongs to all those who have been joined to Christ's death through baptism and raised again to the new life of faith. And so we wait with patience, like the farmer, like the runner who pushes through. Like the, and we know that the way things are in this life is not the way things will be forever. We know that when heaven's reign breaks through for good, then Isaiah's prophecy will be fully revealed. When we know the things that Jesus did for a little bit in his earthly life, the miracles will be the way things are forever in heaven. The lame man leaping like the deer, the tongue of the deaf singing, no cancer, no dying, no sorrow, no crying, no pain, only sunshine. There's a story about a, uh, 
a man and his dog. True story, apparently. And they would walk every day to the train station, and he'd get on the train and he'd go into work. And then the dog would walk home. And then in the evening, the dog, he knew what time, he'd walk to the train station and he'd pick his master up and they'd walk home together. One day, while at work, the master suffered a heart attack and died. And for nine years, that dog kept walking back to the train station, waiting, hoping that his master would come back. It's a good example of patience, although it's also kind of depressing because it never happened. The dog never found his hope. That's because his patience was based upon something uncertain, a dead hope. Not so for us. Peter tells us in the first chapter of his first epistle that we have a living hope, and it is Jesus Christ. That because he died and did not stay dead, we know he is coming again. And we can wait for him with patience, far more reason for patience than a dog has, or even than a farmer or even than a runner. And so as James says, we wait with patience and steadfastness. For don't you hear? Your Savior, your Savior is near. Amen.